Dr. Dana Artie is a corporate anthropologist. She is a human capital consultant, a chief talent officer, and most recently, author of The Fall of the Alphas. So, to your question earlier, <laughs> she wants to talk about <laughs> the difference between um, the alpha organization and the beta organization. So we will answer your question now. Welcome, Thank Dana. you so much. So nice to be with all of you today. Um, so you call yourself a corporate anthropologist. That's an interesting term. Tell us more about that. How did you, how did you get to that point? What kinds of things do you do? So um, corporate anthropology is a phrase that I coined uh, to describe a bunch of services that I was providing for my clients. When I go into a company and work with the executive team and the community, I really try and put myself in the shoes of a Jane Goodall or a Margaret Mead, and I say, well, now I'm going into this new universe, this new culture. By the way, there is a gorilla or two involved. <laughs> and I try and look around and I say, what is this community about? What do they value? How do they communicate? Who are the people that are the networkers that you know, spread the gospel or spread the values? What are the values? What is the mission? What's the physical space? Um, are they a diverse group? Do they have common purpose and common meaning? What are their missions? So uh, uh, I find that anthropology and the study of anthropology uh, I'm an educator and a psychologist and an anthropologist by training. Um, I find that putting myself in that frame of reference when I go in allows me to see things in companies and hold a mirror back to the executive team. It's really interesting because when I go out they say, this is our mission statement, this is our values. And then when I do my work I find that it's really the antithesis. That may be what the slogan on the coffee mug says but that's not really what's happening in the halls. And so I'm able to then put that frame of reference back to my client and we can start doing our work, rolling up our sleeves and doing our work. So what, what are the alphas and why are they falling as you write in your book? So um, why did I write a book? It was never one of those things where I had a burning desire to put myself in a room for 18 months. Uh, in fact, the first few months, I was like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. You know, the same thing came out over and over again. But it was really something that came out of my curiosity. Uh, one of the parts of my practice is I coach very high impact players, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, CEOs. And I found that people would come in my office, and they loved their profession. They uh, really enjoyed the kind of work that they chose for themselves, they hated where they are. And I kept on saying, well, if all these things are positive, how come you're not happy? It was like, find me another place. I do this really well, find me another place. And I realized that it was because they were involved in very hierarchical systems. And uh, I called that alpha. Alpha meaning very traditional, based on the World War II model, where there was a general or a CEO on the top, and then the pyramid fell from there, very up the corporate ladder from the 1950s. And when I started to look at the people that were unhappy and why they were unhappy, I realized that they would talk about internal competition. They would talk about being blocked by politics. So I got very curious. How come in all of our worlds, in all of the things that technology enables, networks are replacing hierarchies? But the way we organize ourselves and work are still hierarchical. And so um, it was from that that I decided to look at the alphas and look at the way they practice in those hierarchical uh, structures and to evolve a new way of thinking about collaboration. I call that the beta leader. So if you think of alpha as the military model, and in my book I, I really did a lot of uh, uh, thoughtful research about what was the history of that model? How did it come to be? <clears throat> it wasn't always that way. In fact, uh, first societies were very collaborative. You know, people really worked the farms together. Uh, there was a lot of diversity. There was a lot of gender diversity. People had roles, but they all contributed. Um, and it wasn't until really uh, uh, the industrial age and World War II where it was just an easier way to organize. 
And in fact, when I even looked into, and in my book I talk about, you know, everybody says, well, there's always an alpha, look at the animal research. Actually, that's not the case. In fact, in many animal societies, uh, 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 in fact, the ones that are closest to us, uh, there's a very networked hierarchy. And so uh, that was the curiosity that started my journey and led me to uh, saying that the fall of the alphas and the rise of the betas. Now, people who know me know that I'm not a black or white kind of person. I'm a gray person. So I think it's on a continuum and a spectrum. And I really try in my book not to say that one is bad and one is good, but to just chronicle the difference and show how collaboration really can aid an enterprise and really create an opportunity for people to find more joy and happiness in their work. So is the heart of the beta organization the lack of hierarchy or the, in, to borrow Marie's term, the intensity of collaboration? Which, <clears throat> what defines the betaness of an organization? So I like to think about beta leadership. Uh, if you think of the alpha as the hierarchical military model, you think of the beta as more like an orchestra where there's a leader or a conductor, and then there are multiple players, there are first chairs, and depending on the task at hand, the piece of music at hand, they pick from the orchestra, and sometimes you lead, and sometimes you follow. And so the beta organization, the way I describe it, is very collaborative, but there's still leadership. And the thing is, is that leadership is not static. So it's not that always you're the follower, there are no leaders without followers, but sometimes your skill set is the best, or you have the best opportunity to contribute, or you should be the leader because you have the best feel. It was your initiative, your innovation that came to the table, and so you lead now. So it takes a very kind of informed type of beta leadership, one that's very mindful, one that's very good listener, one that's very self-evolved to be able to say, you know what, I'm not the best one in the organization, even though you know, uh, uh, I am tasked with the responsibility for this team. I'm going to make myself a follower. I'll give you an example. One of my clients during uh, 2008 uh, had to do some belt tightening. And so uh, uh, they called me and they said, we're going to have to lose jobs. You know, it's 2008. The world is falling apart. Uh, everyone's cutting. We have to cut. Help us figure out what jobs to cut. And I said, well, before you really take people out of your organization, let's go through a different exercise. Let's find efficiencies. And they said, we've done that. We had the leadership team in there, and they decided that the only way to get the efficiencies was you know, to cut some heads. And I said, well, did you engage the community? And they said, no. And I said, well, let's trickle it down. Let's form some committees to look at efficiencies. How can we make things work better? Where can we save money? You know, and so we did that. It was amazing. We didn't lose one person. We didn't lose one person. We, we job shared. That came from the employee population. The administrative assistants decided we're spending too much money on snacks. We could have cold drinks, but we could have vending machines at cost. That saved us one person's job. Um, one of the other uh, young analysts decided that there was a fish tank. And we all took that for granted. But when he dug into it, he realized that those fish that we loved were fish that were being replaced by some vendor every month, and they were tropical fish that cost a fortune. We saved two jobs. You know? And so we went about looking for efficiencies. It sounds like little things, and it sounds silly, but by engaging the organization and everybody belt tightening, we also got lots of innovative suggestions of how we could go to our clients and make them more efficient. And the whole organization became uh, leaner and meaner and more successful. And we got through it. Not only did we do well, but we did very well during that period. And so I'm always advocating, you know, top down, hierarchical would be, we decided what we need to do. Let's take the easiest route. We'll cut some jobs. And that seemed to be intuitive to them. The community took a different tack. And this client, with my help, was evolved enough to listen to the community. And the rewards for the entire community were great. So you work with a lot of people at the very top of organizations. 
if you're not at the top of an organization, do you just throw up your hands and say, well, I'm going to wait until they decide to make it a beta organization? Or can, is there something that everybody can do Good question. to shift toward beta? I, I think when you think about yourself and whatever position you have in an organization, you need to be a leader. And that's at every level of an organization. And to be a beta leader means you're open, you're communicative, you get to know your peers, you bring value wherever you can, and more importantly, you're very evolved about what you can bring, what A game do you bring to contribute to that team. Now, it's not easy. Uh, uh, a buddy of mine, Rob Cross, does social networking research. You have to be the change agent you want to be. You know, but I think if you start to volunteer, to take initiative, to start to work with the small groups of people around you. I'll give you an example. I was speaking to a group, exactly a group like this in Seattle, not too long ago. And uh, I was talking about how communities need to get together and can change organizations. Just by having communal values and by opening, teams opening themselves up to each other's great identified skills and strengths and understanding each other's weaknesses too to say, I know I'm better at the numbers than you. Can I help you here? And so I, I talked about collaboration. And uh, one brave woman in the audience said, I'm from Microsoft. And we're going through a CEO succession. We've only had two uh, CEOs in our entire uh, organization. And we're, we're looking for a third. And uh, our board has been taking on this process. And they're very secretive. We're not a beta organization, are we, doctor? And how would you change that? So they thought I would say, well, I'm a consultant. I'd love to come in and roll up my <laughs> sleeves. And by the way, I would. But that's not what I said at all. I said, well, what I think is not happening is the community is not weighing in. They're not saying, here you have 150,000 smart people who really love their company. They call on every major corporation globally. You must have some ideas of what skills you need for the future, how you would like to be led. Who would be a viable candidate? I said, why don't you create an internal dialogue and then communicate with the board as a community? And that's exactly what they did. You know, after that talk, and I wrote about this in uh, Fortune magazine, we, we put out an article. They started a Yammer group, and the Yammer group started to weigh in, and the board started to notice. And in fact, they made an excellent choice. But again, what an, a missed opportunity for the culture for the board and for the community to get together to say, how are we going to look at our company for the next generation? How are we going to make things happen together? And uh, this month, I just wrote an article for corporate boards and directors on beta boards, how boards just talk to one person. They talk to the CEO and maybe the CFO, and how they really need to trickle down and become part of the community. Because guess what? We're all the shareholders. We are the shareholders of our company. We are the assets. And so we have to take advantage and unleash that power. So if we all left the room today and did one thing differently, just as a first step, what would you recommend we do? Certainly read my book. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, no, no, I agree. It's an excellent book. <laughs> so no, I think, I think if you were to do one thing, it's know yourself. Go through an exercise of self-awareness. Who are you? What skills do you bring? Where are you in terms of your company? Is it an alpha company and could you make changes? Or is it not a place where you can be productive and innovative? And should you go looking for a place where they would value your skills and talents? But I think holding the mirror to yourself and being self-aware is really the first step. So are there some people who really should just be in alpha organizations and they should seek that out. I know you do a lot of recruiting, so you're always looking at talent and where to match them up. I mean, are there people, I know it's a continuum, but are there some people who are, they just don't operate well in a beta environment? So even, even if we looked at companies that we would say are very alpha in their approach to their business, even within the ranks, there are teams there that are collaborating. So the, the genie is out of the bottle. I mean, we are in a network society. And all I'm saying is, let's take advantage of that. You know, um, how many of you have ever heard of the IKEA effect? OK, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what it is. And then it's the same thing when it comes to organizations. 
So they've done research on IKEA. So IKEA makes an okay product. If anyone's here from IKEA, you know I have no bone to pick with you. It's an okay product. But people who buy IKEA furniture love it. They adore it. They're proud of it. Does anyone know why? Because they build it. They assemble it. So there's a real pride in putting it together. So you can go to someone's home and they'll have an IKEA desk and they'll go, that's my desk, you know, because they've, they've done something to impact what that desk is. And that's the way I think about beta organization. It's the IKEA effect. When people are empowered, when people really make a difference, you don't have to win. It's not a total democracy ever. But when you're empowered and you really weigh in and you understand the logic of the thinking of the organization, it makes it a lot easier to get behind whatever leadership is there. And so it's not alpha or beta. It's how are you going to change? How are your work groups going to change? And how are you going to think about, it's easy for me to do that myself, but maybe I should consult some of my colleagues and get the best input. You know, when I first started out working in the 1950s, the first generation of women in the workforce, uh, I remember taking my first executive position. I was so excited. And one of the women that was mentoring me gave me this book. And she said, you must read this book. And it was during the Betty Friedan period, you know, Power to the Women, Women's Lib. And it was called The Games My Mother Never Taught Me. And it was about how a woman in business needed to get ahead and you couldn't be perceived as a secretary and you should never take minutes at meetings. So I go to my first meeting and the guys are sitting around the table, mostly men, and they say, who's going to take minutes? And they go, oh, well, we'll let the, the new doctor, the new recruit. And I said, oh, my God, there you go. My career is over. You know, I, I said, they see me as a secretary. You know, I think I'm an executive. So how am I going to change that perception? So I did that job. I took the minutes. And then I realized there was great power in it. I didn't go for the common wisdom. If you take the minutes, you're the secretary. I said, well, if I'm really the secretary, then I have to be the documenter of what went on in the meeting. So I used that as an opportunity to call all my colleagues and say, you know, in the meeting you said this and this. I quite didn't understand that. Do you mind if I stop by your office and get clarification? And I did. I called somebody else. I said, you know, you had a great idea in that meeting. Could we talk about it? Because I think we should talk about that at the next meeting. And I'd like to put it on the agenda for the next meeting. All of a sudden, I became one of the most powerful people in the organization. They had never had such great minutes. And more importantly, I had gotten the note. This is why I knew I was destined to be in the human capital field. I was organizing them in different ways. I was taking responsibility for initiatives. And so being the secretary, and I tell that uh, uh, to people, men and women going into the workforce, being that keeper of the notes, being a keeper of the ideas, and being able to put people together around ideas, there's great power in that. That's a great example. And it's a really good lead in to letting you ask some questions. I'm going to go to you first. What is your name? Kim. Hi, Kim. Have we answered the question that you brought up before? Well, I think my question was more about as the new generations come into the workplace, what Marie was talking about is their killer instinct and the ranking and, and then also this huge network. Will hierarchy now be based on the strength of your network? rather than what it is today, I guess is what I'm asking now that I've heard both. both. So networks are only good if you use them for good. You know, so you know, using your brand and your profile and saying, I have 5,000 friends, yeah, right. Um, what do they do for you? And how can you mobilize them? So it's not just the networks. It's how you use the influence of those networks and how you mine them and how you contribute to them. And how, again, there's no leaders without followers, how people want to follow you and understand you're a thought leader. The nice thing about the networks is that it's a fantastic exchange of ideas and it allows for dialogue around different topics. So that's first. Right, back to millennials. I, I do a lot of work with millennials. And in my practice, I make big companies think small and small companies think big. And so that's one of the reasons people hire me. And I work with a lot of the top uh, digital um, new generation, new economy companies. And you know. I think the millennials get a bad rap. You know, um, what they're saying is, we're young. You know, we're coming into the workforce. We have to fight for our piece of, ter of territory. But we have new tools. And it's really the alphas that are saying, I wish the social media thing would go away. Why do they have to be at my desk? Well, 
we're talking about a generation that grew up on e-pinions. You know, they, they crowdsource whether they're going to the movies. They, they collaborate around, you know, uh, they take selfies every day of their life. You know, I was, I was with a 10-year-old the other day who was giving me the rules of selfies. You only take one a day, because if you take two, they think you're a narcissist. I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, they're managing their brands now from the time they're, they're 10 years old, you know. Um, so it, it's amazing to watch. But I find the millennials uh, are, are really good. They need to be mentored. And the best programs I've created in organizations are where I make the baby boomers and the millennials work together through a whole series of collaborations I have, and they change the whole organization because they really learn from mm. each other. I mean, I send them out on calls together, client calls, the way they follow up, the way they work together. I put them in, I put them in book clubs. I'm like Oprah. Every organization I go in, I, I insist that we have a book club, and the first week, two people show up. The second week, the two people, I feed them. So they got good food, and then four people show up, and then by the end we have to have three clubs because you know the room is booming and they're getting a lot out of it. You know, people people have to you know understand the differences of the generations. You know, I have I have a client, a very famous uh, young uh, technologist who, uh, when I first uh, he first engaged me and he said, uh, so I said so I'd like to establish. A weekly talk. Now I'm a, I'm a doctor, so talking through ideas, you know, talking through sensibilities is what I do. And he said, "Well, I don't talk on the phone. I text." I said, "Really?" I said, "Well, I'm going to be talking about your team, your people. I'm going to be talking about you and your leadership style." I said, "Those are very intimate conversations. They're very, you know, confidential." I said, "I think it's probably better that we talk on the phone." He says, "No, I don't talk on the phone. I don't like it." So I said, well, I don't know how I'm going to do my best work, you know. And he said, well, okay, I'll let you talk on the phone, but you can't be verbose. I said, verbose is how I make my living, you know. <laughs> so um, we decided and we negotiated that I would text him and say, it's time to talk. And he would text me back and say, okay. And we, we came up with the weekend early in the morning after he went to the gym as like his best time to talk. And so we started first talking on the telephone. Then he said, gee, I think we should meet for coffee on Saturday. And now we have regular sessions, uh, and he's getting a lot out of it. And he's saying to his team, don't text me. That's just 140 characters or less. I want to talk about it, you know, because, you know, they got it, got it, got it. Part of being that first generation is, you know, they'll send me a text and say, what do you think? And then I won't respond because I'm thinking. And uh, I mean, it makes sense to me, right? And then they'll call me on the telephone and go, you didn't respond to my uh, text. And I said, you told me to think. I'm thinking. They said, well, when will you be done? I said, I don't know. I'll let you know. You know it's an emergency. And they say, well, it's urgent. And I said, OK, I'll think harder. So, you know, <laughs> you know, so we get there. We get there with a little bit of humor. But I think you know, right now with the millennials, people are digging in. They're giving them a big rap. I find them to be fantastic. I, I find them to be full of entrepreneurism and ideas and have social conscience. And, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, the problem is a little more with my generation that's not opening up. They just want to hold on until they could retire. And that word doesn't even work anymore, but they just want to hold on. They don't want the world to get past them. And so we have to demystify some of the things that are happening for them and decode it. I think that's great. Well, actually, we we really don't have time for another question. Oh, and, sorry. And um, comment. How about if you give us one final thought to um, to activate people to make some changes? So, um, you know, again, uh, uh, my email is around. I, I love people to talk about collaboration. I've just written a couple of articles for Fast Company on the future of work and where I see it going. I think collaborate, there is no other way. I call my book uh, uh, Communication, Connection, Influence, Curation, Curation meaning putting things together. The genie is out of the bottle. It's time for us to take action. It's time for you to look at your behavior and open yourself up. And the rewards are great. That's all I could say. The rewards are great. Thank, thank you. you.
That's Thank a you for great listening. place for us to end on. Thank, Thank you. you.